Welcome to another episode of the Love to Move podcast, where we take a look at all the definitions of the word move and tell you why we love them. Today's movement that we're going to be talking about has all to do with food. We are going to be talking to Sherry Traxler about intuitive eating and some of her journey and movement through the foodscape. There are a lot of very actionable steps that Sherry shares with us, uh, even her framework around how to handle intuitive eating and some of the scales that you can use for yourself to be able to start to understand what in the world is my relationship with food and how do I need to try to better understand it and heal it and think about it. I hope that this episode really helps you move into a better understanding of what food is like in our society, the difference between dieting and truly eating. I hope that you join me in welcoming Sherry Traxler. Well, as the way I'm always am is my life is an open book as long as I'm not violating trust with somebody else in my life. I like that. Um, th this is something that I, I have always told my mom, even when I was like a little kid uh, and growing up as a teenager, is she, w she would ask me, she would go, oh, can't you tell me the secret? I go, no, I promised this person. It's a secret. And she goes, but this person doesn't even know me. Like, I don't know this person. They don't know me. We'll never interact in our lives. I'm like, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point was they said, I would tell nobody else. You are somebody. Sorry. Yeah. Can't can't do it. Not really sorry, but that was my, my general uh -huh. view of it is I'm not going to tell this anybody. This is my excuse to not have to tell mom. Yeah. Oh, and she was really annoyed because I, I'd be so stubborn about it. And it would be the smallest thing. It wouldn't really even be something like earth shattering secret mm -hmm. of, you know, and like my best friend is selling drugs. They didn't, but I'm just, yeah. it's, it's not yeah. something that would immediately make her be very concerned for my safety, but I was like, no, you're not allowed to know. It doesn't matter. But she's, uh, she's a bit nosy. <laughs> So it was for her own good, for her own good to know that she shouldn't necessarily have to know, know about those kinds of things. Um, but yes, let's talk a little more about you, however, okay. even though my mom can be a fascinating subject. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do like psychoanalyzing our parents. Yes. As I've done more and more over the years. So I know that a lot of times when people look at Sherry Traxler online, it's, it's a lot of diet things. It's thinking about food and uh, intuitive eating, which I think is, is partially a limiting way in, in what you do. That is a portion of what you do, but really there's so much that where you provide the physical benefits, emotion, mental, spiritual of, of how all of these kind of parts uh, interact and help us live this kind of better, more fulfilled life, be yeah. that energy in, for your day and more productivity or just, you know, being happier while you're eating um, as opposed to all those negative thoughts that we can sometimes get. Yes. Before we get into all of that stuff cool. that I know you love talking about, can you tell us a little more about how you, you came onto the path of discovering these things and going, yes, this is what I want to do. This is, this is why I'm driven to do this. Oh gosh. Okay. So there are personal things that came up when I was, uh, both of my parents were teachers. So I came out of the womb being asked, Sherry, what do you want to be when you grow up? And early on, I wanted to be a maid because I think in kindergarten, I wanted to be a maid because I liked to clean my room. I liked to organize things. Um, my least favorite room in the house to clean was the kitchen because I'd get it clean. And then somebody an hour later would come in and completely mess it up. Whereas the bathroom, you could clean the bathroom and it would stay clean until people took their showers the next day. So I digress. I wanted to be a maid. And then I discovered, no, I don't really want to do that. By third grade, mom was asking me, do you want to be a nurse? Because she was noticing either caretaking traits or just how I handled myself, how I interacted with her. And she also could tell I was getting an interest in health, the physical body. I was one of those, I would look at the back of the, was it the Wheaties box that would have all of the, like the Olympians, and then they would have different nutrients. No, it was, maybe it was Wheaties or Total, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And you could learn what the different vitamins did. And I was always just drawn <laughs> to that. And so she was, you know, do you want to be a nurse? 
Well, in my mind, Stefan, as a third grader, nurses changed bedpans and wiped people's bottoms. And that was all they did. And so I was like, no, mom, I appreciate the idea, but I really don't want to be a nurse. So I just, I just kept looking for it. And by the time I was a junior in high school, my mother was my high school English teacher. And she had us do career papers. Did you have to do a career paper in high school? Uh, maybe. maybe. I can't even remember, remember. what I wrote. It was yeah. so different than, than what I went into. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it was a research paper, and we would go in, and you, know, you would research things. And as I was researching, I came across this thing called exercise physiology. Mm -hmm. And this was in 86, 1986. I'm giving away my age. You now know my age. So in 1986 and so it was it was a brand new field uh there were only a few handful of colleges that even had that as a degree and i was like that's it that's why god put me on this earth because the the thinking was always i don't want to help sick people get well i want to help well people stay well and have high performance not in an athlete not in athletics because that was the bent my brother went to. He's mm -hmm. a strength coach at Vanderbilt. He's, he works with his athletes. I'm always telling him, give your athletes my card so that after they've been sitting at their desk <laughs> um, and graduated and sitting at a desk for a while and getting out of shape, then they're gonna go, well, you know, why is it I'm going out of breath going up these stairs or whatever? Then they can call me. So that's, mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to get into it from a just being drawn standpoint. Mm -hmm. I was also driven into it. And that was personal of body image issues, my own dieting. I started dieting right around that same time in third grade. I was nine years old when I went on my first diet, not because I needed to lose weight, but because that's just what the women in my family did. So I figured out, okay, well, you know, I, I could lose two pounds. And so I got a diet and exercise magazine, which I still have. And I figured out in there, it showed you how to count calories. And I learned how to do that. And it was a drivenness then because I felt like that's what I should do personally. Mm -hmm. And it started my whole yo-yo dieting downward spiral in that. But it was an interesting tug of war. Maybe that's not the right word because... I also loved the exercise part of it, where that was when my mom and I would go walk and talk and, you know, all the teenage angst stuff. We, you know, we would talk through things as I was a kid and a teenager, and that was our time together to just vent. It's interesting that we have some similarities in that around high school, I had an issue of where I stopped sports in the beginning of high school and the pounds inevitably caught up with me, mm -hmm. to which point my parents were basically saying, you should move more and eat less. But that's, that's all the guidance I was given. Right. I was like, that's right. all you do. And I also probably had some disordered eating if I had to label it kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And, and it, it wasn't smart. I had no idea what I was doing. I slowly, that's kind of how I found my way back to exercise uh, and all those kinds of things. It's interesting that you're mentioning your relationship uh, with your mom as it kind of went through all that. Because I, I can only imagine what it's like to have your mother as an English teacher in high school. I'm sure. And the fact that you still would go on these walks, you still interacted. It wasn't a, no, mom, I'm never talking to you. I see enough uh -huh. of you at school. Uh -huh. um, and I know that to a degree she was this inspiration um, or helped you as far as the book, as far as your hiking, uh, all these things. Um, how did you feel that that relationship developed? Did it always kind of start strong? Because at, even at the third grade level, you were thinking, well, I trust my mom. She's my role mm -hmm. model. And it stayed that way where there's some rocky up and downs. How did it go? Oh, I love that question. We had moments I wouldn't call it rocky up and down. Mm -hmm. I would just call it, oh, I just did something and totally embarrassed my mother in public. Sorry, mom, didn't know that, you know, or she would do something that would be like, you know, the typical, you know, mom just dropped me off at the movies. Don't, you know, kind of, I, you know, pretend you don't have parents. Why is it as teenagers? <laughs> you know, we wanted to pretend we didn't have parents. But it was always just a strong relationship. And I attribute that to her. Mm -hmm. because she was always a mom who 
let's sit, you know, if something's troubling you, let's sit down and talk about it. Not in a prying way, not in a, I'm going to try to fix this and solve it. Because even like the, what do you want to be when you grow up? It wasn't that she saw my bent and said, you should be a nurse. Let's start getting you on that track. It's, you know, have you thought about nursing? What do you think about nursing? You know, opening to explore and discuss, never push. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. And something that you mentioned before when we talked with your mom is this idea of when you were walking, it's the fact that when you walk and hike, it's not this confrontational, kind of what we're doing right now, but it's nevertheless this, I'm staring at you, we're having this this emotional thing, and with teenage angst, that can be a lot, as opposed to when you're walking side by side, you mm-hmm. don't have to have that eye contact necessarily, and it gives you a little bit more space to be a little bit more vulnerable, even though eye contact can be important in some other places. Yeah. I, I yeah. liked that point. Um, there's there's some fun research about like even interviews that sometimes if you sit on the same side of the table, um, it's more of a cooperative relationship Absolutely. as opposed to across when you're staring at each other, it's more of a competitive. Yes. Uh, well, when it's you know, whether it's an interview, whether it's talking to an employee about an issue, whatever it is, coming to the same side of the table so that you can make some eye contact. You can also I mean, as as we've done. If mm-hmm. I'm thinking about a question, I'm looking up or I'm looking down. I'm not staring hard <laughs> and, you know, a, a parent staring hard at you, you can feel like you're, am I going to say something wrong? But if you're just side by side, you're friends, you're talking it out, it doesn't feel threatening. I, I, absolutely. I can't imagine the number of times that I've had my parents stare down at me and going, oh no, what, what do I say? Is this the wrong uh-huh. thing, the right thing? You and- know that's so weird as you say that, Stefan? I can count on probably two fingers the times that I ever felt that way with my mom. Hmm. And even then it was not them, her coming down. It was just more, you know, okay, yeah, you still are the parent. We're, we're, we, we haven't crossed to being just friends as adults. It's, I'm, I am still the kid. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> And I think that stays there, at least from my mom's perspective, she's repeatedly said it's it's hard for her to let go of that connection. She still always will treat me as the kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it's it, it's harder to to let go. So we're on this journey. you've you've gotten to exercise physiology, um, but exercise physiology doesn't have a whole lot to do with diet, not necessarily. Um, that's not what it, the main focus mm-hmm. of it. There is a little bit of that in there, but right. really we're talking about movement and all that. So how did you find your passion and starting to move towards, okay, I understand that, you know, nutrition, food has to be a portion of this that we have to discuss. Yeah. The, yes, and at least in the course that I took at Belmont, that track we had, we did have a semester in nutrition. I I still have my nutrition book from that because it's such a great resource book. But it was from a personal journey where I realized One, I kept dieting through college, yo-yo dieting, and it was, it was destructive in so many ways. Um, And we can get into any of that that you want. It's it's dieting in the traditional sense is, it's horrific uh, of what it does. Well, I began to realize in my early twenties, this is not working. I don't know another way, but this is not working. And I had a good basic nutrition foundation from that course at Belmont, but I didn't know anything about intuitive eating. So I just started myself going and figuring, you know, looking in the library. And at that time, there were maybe two books, um, Diets Don't Work and Breaking Out of Food Gel. There may have been others, but those, those were the only two I could find. And I read them and it opened my eyes to, okay, there is another way. And I just started then reading and recognizing that nutrition doesn't have to mean all this regimented stuff. Mm -hmm. Nutrition can mean you've got an awareness, but unless you're dealing with a disease that's something that has to have something really structured with it or strict with it, your, your body was designed to, you know, Stefan, your body your body your your body was designed to tell you what it needs when it needs it how much it needs and in third grade i completely threw that out the window 
I think that's fair. I think a lot of times when we think about diets, um, it, it is this regimented thing. It's the numbers. Everybody goes, well, how much can you eat? And it's, it's like, okay, yeah. it's not. How many, how many calories or how yeah. many grams of carbs or how many grams of protein? And it's not that there's not a place for that. Like if you're a competitive bodybuilder, you probably want to look at your grams of protein. You know, there, there are places for those things. Um, but it's not a whole lifestyle, everything super structured. I know the difference for anybody who might not know. Could you tell us a little bit more about yo-yo dieting um, and then r really why, why that doesn't work and sort of a little bit more about intuitive eating because some people might not be familiar with those specific uh, words. Okay, so picture a yo-yo going up and down and that yo-yo is your weight. And it's because you are on a diet and, so, and it doesn't even have to be a crash diet. You're on a diet, you lose the weight, whatever it is, and then you stop the diet. And you stop the diet either because so many psychological reasons of fear of deprivation, um, the sense of autonomy that we're supposed to have. This diet is telling me what to do and it's actually my body that's supposed to tell me that. So I rebel against it. It's a very healthy thing. Um, and that you stop the diet and then you gain the weight back. Well, because of what that dieting does to your metabolism, well, not yours, because you're not dieting. If you're dieting to your metabolism, then you're going to gain it back plus some. And that was what was happening to me is I would, I would have had anorexic tendencies and then I became an exercise bulimic. And if you want to know what that term is, it's uh, anorexia is when your body weight gets below a certain point. Bulimia is you are going through cycles of binging and purging, purging either through vomiting or something like that. In my case, it was purging through exercise. I would go walk 15 miles, not because I was going for a hike to hike 15 miles, but mm -hmm. okay, I had X number of calories today, so I need to go burn all of that off. And that causes up and down in the weight. Intuitive eating, there are a couple of versions of mindful eating out there. Intuitive eating, I got certified through the dietitians who coined the term intuitive eating. And it's a process that they take you through. The version that I teach is so when I came up with through all of my reading before even knowing about them. And I think it's much simpler. So I use their principles, but I frame it in a way that's easier for me and my clients to digest. So do you want me to go through the letters? Sure. Okay. So in, the way I teach intuitive eating is H-W-S-S. -S. H is how physically hungry are you? It's like as I'm sitting here right now on a scale of 1 to 10, 5 being neutral, not having any sensation at all in my digestive system or my whole body, 4 being, okay, maybe there's some intermittent hunger. You know, it's like maybe I'm getting hungry. Maybe there's some kind of growling or... But I'm still able to focus on this conversation. No, it's not distracting me. A three is, this is pleasant hunger. I'm not angry. I'm not frustrated. I'm not ready to go forget this interview. I'm going to go eat right now. <laughs> That's a two. A three is pleasant hunger. It's, it's when food tastes... Have you ever come to the table and everything tasted so much better than it would have if you had just sat down and you weren't physically hungry the, yeah. the, the flavors are enhanced that's pleasant hunger mm -hmm. it's just it's uh there's an old saying that hunger is the best flavor or the best seasoning mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's like you come to the table hungry plain squash with nothing on it is going to taste good so that's the first letter is h how hungry are you w what do you really want mm -hmm. and that's Oh gosh, that's that's a big can to to open and look into. So is what do I want right now? Do I want something crunchy, something salty, something sweet, something creamy? Well, you know, texture, taste, uh, temperature. Also, do I want to feel great two hours from now, mm -hmm. or do I want? Am I okay to have a, a sugar drop? You know, where you know. If, if I really want X, Y, Z, am I okay with not feeling great a couple of hours from now? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. How do I want 
to present this food? How do I, you know, what is it I'm wanting now? What is it I'm wanting to feel like a couple of hours from now? And the first of the two S's at the end, so HWSS, the first S is slow and savor. Mm -hmm. This one's the hard one for me. This is the one where we don't eat in front of the computer while we're checking email. We don't eat in front of the TV. We don't eat while we're scrolling social media. You are focused on the food. And that should be easy because if you come to the table physically hungry, the food's going to taste really good. But for whatever reason in our culture, whether it's, I love your opinion on this. I've been talking for a while. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is more multitasking that people feel as though they just don't have time to eat and you know it's like okay i've got to get this done and i'll just eat while i'm doing this do you think it's why do you think that is i'd love to because i mean i know my clients tell me all different things but i'd love other people's opinions too sure i if i had to nail it down especially for myself because honestly as i'm listening to this I'm finding out a lot of things about myself, of possible <laughs> characteristics of like an, the exercise. We can just turn this thing. into a coaching session yeah, if just, you want. That's what it sounds like it needs to be. Um, I think there there is an amount of that dopamine hit of where I I want to be distracted. I need to be doing something, and I I, I because I am usually so distracted that even sometimes when we watch movies. I'll be on my phone playing a game or doing something while watching the movie yeah. because my, I want my brain to be that amount of distracted yes. and that hit fast. Yeah. When I'm eating, I don't feel I'm getting that amount of dopamine and You're that not. hit as fast. So therefore, I immediately reach for something else because the brain is starting to feel bored and it needs something else. I think that's it's more of that instant gratification. That's that's what it is for me. I, I think you hit it on the nose because when I've talked with clients about when they say, well, I just don't have time. There are situations and days that you don't, you know, that, that literally, in fact, this happened to me one day last week that I was teaching a workshop at midday. I came in and we had a contractor here doing something. And so I was dealing with the contractor, but I was physically hungry. So I couldn't tell the contractor, you just sit and chill for 20 minutes while and it's like, no, but those should be very rare occasions. A parent with a young child trying to sit down and have a lovely dinner. No, they're going to be feeding their kid and catching you know, There's moments and, and seasons, mm -hmm. but typically what I find is what you talked about, Stefan, and that is it's not the, I truly don't have time because later on they still go watch part of a movie or a TV show or something. It's, we want that dopamine hit. And I have found for me, that is it. Because we do not like to be bored. Mm -hmm. And sitting at the table, eating this delicious broccoli rice casserole, it's boring for what we do today. It's kind of like, you know, okay, I'm gonna go sit in nature for five minutes we're bored in 15 seconds and we want that rush like you were talking about and it's interesting that you said that because a few weeks ago i was talking to a group and one of the women brought this up it's like oh but i'm going to be bored and i said yes and there are two things that happen with that and i would challenge you we will turn this into a little bit of coaching Stefan. i would challenge you to take one meal every couple of days, don't even have to, don't even commit to every day, but just one meal every couple of days or so for a week mm -hmm. and allow yourself to get bored and watch, you can set a timer if you want to, see how long it takes for your imagination to kick in. I have gotten some of the best content ideas. I've solved some of the most weird grappling problems or personal issues going on between me and somebody else when I'm sitting at the table and allow myself to be bored because we don't allow that. And what I have found, this has taken us all the way to another topic of sleep. What I have found is when I allow myself to do that, I sleep better because I've not had those dopamine hits and mind going all day long and then head hit the pillow 
And that's the first time my brain has been allowed to have things bubble up. If three times a day I'm allowing things to bubble up, I'm clear when I go to bed. And the other big thing that that boredom does, because you won't be bored the whole time, your brain will not allow you to be bored mm -hmm. for very long. It's going to entertain you. That I like that phrase. I'm going to use that as a quote. Um, the last S is stop when you're physically satisfied. If I'm eating and I'm scrolling or I'm eating and I'm watching a movie, it's very easy for me to miss when my body goes, thank you, that was the last bite that I needed. Because your body will tell you that. It's very subtle, but it will tell you. And you're not going to be stuffed at two or three bites after that. You're not even going to be full in the sense of I feel the food full two or three bites after that. But once your body says, okay, that's all I need right now, every bite after that is getting stored. And for the clients who come to me and they're saying, I, I want weight loss eventually. I don't want a heavy focus on it because that's going to put me in the diet mentality and we don't want to go there. I've, I've been there, done that. But eventually, you know, I do want, I'm like, this is one of the keys is, you know, there's two keys to it. All four letters working together, but two big ones are, am I coming to the table physically hungry? Because mm -hmm. if I'm not, I'm giving myself food when I don't need it. And then as soon as my body says I'm done, I stop knowing that there's no deprivation. Next time I'm physically hungry, I can come back and get more food. There's, there's no, you know, restriction on that. And we know that when we eat distracted, research shows us this, we average eating 10% more calories than what our body needs. Hmm. That doesn't sound like a lot. You know, if somebody needs 2000 calories a day, I'm going to, you know, you're a male, five, seven, you said. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay, somewhere around 2000 ish, give or take a little, probably a little bit more than that is, is what you would need. So if you have 2200 a day, or maybe you only do this a couple meals, so it's 20, you know, it's maybe it's only an extra 100 calories or something. Your age, that's going to burn off. You're going to get extra. You, you move a lot. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all going to pan out. But somebody who is sitting all day long, suddenly they're wondering, how is it I gained a pound this month? Mm -hmm. How is it I gained a pound over the past two months? It might be not because, and, and you're looking at it going, I don't sit in front of the TV and eat three bags of chips or a gallon of ice cream a night. Nope, it's just those little things over time because you're not paying attention. So I, I know that I definitely need to slow down um, and savor that. That first S is going to be probably my most important thing. I'm usually pretty good about going with, okay, how hungry am I? Yes. Um, and kind of coupling it with, with the W of going... Is this a, I am bored hungry and I just want to eat some sugar and I just need that and that's mm -hmm. the only reason I'm hungry? Or am I actually feeling feeling the, the hunger? Which right. I think that can be a tough thing because that's yes. that's what I sometimes I'll uh, ask my wife is sometimes I'm like, okay, are you hungry though? Or do you just want a sweet? Like mm -hmm. what, what is, where's the difference? Mm -hmm. uh, because we just had a giant meal. That's my usual problem is I'll eat this giant meal and then I'll go, but I want a sweet. And what I found before is I could eat probably a second plate of food, not be satisfied. But if I have that sweet, it closes the loop and I'm done. Yes. Um, yes. And it's because you paid attention to the W, you paid attention right. to what you wanted. And that's, but, but that can definitely still be tough for me. Here's where I struggle. And since we're turning it into a coaching session, why not? I wonder if people struggle with this as well is I will do that thing of where Okay, I ate the first bowl, and then I'm going. No, nah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still really, really hungry. I, it's still up there. I'll eat that second bowl, and then I'm going. But I still want that little sweet or something, some kind of a dessert. And usually, my desserts lately have been an apple and maybe some peanut butter with it. Mm -hmm. but what happens is I'll eat that, and now I am stuffed, stuffed to the point of where I am thinking I hate myself. How could you ever overeat so much? This is so bad. And so I didn't have that in between moment of where I went. Hold up. You can, st my, I still felt that I wanted and that I needed it. And maybe that's what I'm asking. Where is that line between what I want mm -hmm. versus what I actually need? Maybe what I need is to take a half a glass of water and step back, but that's not what I'm wanting at that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, you 
answered it yourself in there, actually. And that is, what do I, okay, one, what do I want versus what do I need? Mm -hmm. What do I want actually deals more with what is the type of food I want coupled with how do I want to feel? Well, if you know that your stomach is about the size of your fist, so a volume of food that's been chewed up to about this size is approximately enough food. Mm -hmm. So if you've had a bowl of food and you're like, oh, I still really want something, that is the time to do what you just said. And that is to step back and give yourself a pause. Uh, one of the things that helps a lot of my clients is they'll set a timer, a five minute pause. Mm -hmm. When they're looking at it going, this, depending on my activity level today, whatever, you know, I just finished a 10 mile hike. Maybe I am going to be a little bit more hungry. Great. But giving yourself that moment to pause and say, if I am still physically hungry at the end of that, I can have another bowl. Not a problem. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to deprive myself. Or if you're saying, well, I'm still wanting something else, but it's more like I want a dessert. I want something sweet to close out the meal. Give yourself a pause. And one of the beautiful things to do in that pause is to say, how much would it take to satisfy? Mm -hmm. Is it a half of an apple and a tablespoon of peanut butter? Is it two apples and four tablespoons of peanut? You know, what amount would satisfy? I've done this before when I've had a handful of nuts, when I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a little, I'm hungry and it's almost time for dinner. I want something to tide me over. Okay, so I'll get a handful of nuts. And the old me with the diet mentality would just be like, oh yeah, I get a handful of nuts. It's just like, boom, you know, a handful of nuts. Like now it's like, I get the handful and I go, okay, what's the smallest amount to satisfy? Not how little can I get away with? That's the diet mentality. But, mm -hmm. you know, what's the small, where I would actually be satisfied with, I mean, like, you know, I could, I could not have the, yeah, that's, that would, that would be satisfying just to, you know, what I need. So doing that with desserts is helpful too. Does that answer your question? It does. And I think the thing that I'm hearing again and again, even if it's a small amount of food, uh, even though, I could just shove the whole thing in my mouth right away, but that's not the first test. That's not slow and savoring yeah. it. It's yeah. still, because sometimes you think this should satisfy me. And that's a lot of times what happens is I go, this should be enough. And then I quickly eat it and I go, that wasn't enough. Uh, right. Um, because I didn't take the time for yeah. it. Um, well, and that may be what was happening with, you mentioned having a bowl, still wanting more, having a second bowl, and then having dessert, and then being really, really stuffed. It may be that you need the pause, or it may be just eating it, slowly and you can do all kinds of tricks to eat it slowly it can be between every two bites put your fork down it could be counting the number of times that you chew your food mm -hmm. you talk about boring Whew! but i've done it because i when i had to get out of the diet mentality and retrain myself to get back in touch with what my body wanted sometimes you had to go hard on some of these things and that sometimes meant okay i'm going to chew every bite 30 times and, you know, if I'm, if I'm with friends eating, I'm not, I was like, no, we're going to have conversation. We're not just going to so sit here and chew our chew. food. <laughs> like everybody counting how many times they're chewing. But that would make a really interesting retreat. Anyway, mm. that I want to focus on the food and whatever I can do to slow it down, I'm going to. And... The, I lost train of thought when I was thinking about friends getting together, all chewing their food together. I was picturing this, this big long table. Uh, so putting your fork down, setting a uh, setting a timer that every five minutes you just take a you know push back from the table, pause, and just mm -hmm. take a couple of minutes every every five minutes. Take a couple of minutes and just breathe, relax. That and I've got one client who. That is how she likes watching a particular show during her lunch break at work. That is her only time to disengage from everybody else. She's like, so I really want my TV show and it's my only time to eat. But I want to eat not distracted. How do I do this? I'm like, well, okay, then that means you're going to eat for two or three minutes undistracted. And then pause, watch five, ten minutes of the show 
and then either during the next commercial break or if she's watching something streaming and doesn't have commercials but just you get that sense of it's a you can go back and forth if if you're like i'm not ready to go to the full-on set at the table with nothing else mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you can intersperse it just try when you're eating to just eat I think that's that's well said. Just just eat. Don't don't overthink it and don't multitask. I think we've had enough research proven that multitasking doesn't really work. We're not no. as good as we try to think that we are at yes. it. Um, before we leave that entire uh, topic and, and move on, I think it's interesting to talk about your personal definition of the word diet. If I had to define diet, um, I, I, I go, I've, I've said this for years, uh, off by the, the Greek definition of it's a way of life. And that's literally, for me, diet is, that's just the way I eat. I don't mm -hmm. go on a diet. This is my diet. The diet yeah. is the way that I generally eat. Uh, but obviously, as we've said, a lot of people have different definitions because mm -hmm. they'll go to, I can only be on a diet or off a diet, mm -hmm. which then that's a completely different definition. Um, do you find that you have a different definition depending on who you're talking to, obviously, so you can mess it up with them? Or? Well, it's for me, it's two definitions that I mm -hmm. use. One is the classical that you like as well, because that is where diet came from as far as when we think of our current diet culture diet mentality all those things so yes diet from a this is my way of eating this is my lifestyle this is my way of life this is what i'm ingesting in my life diet however when we talk about diet in the general vernacular mm -hmm. we're talking i am restricting this macronutrient or i'm restricting calories overall or i'm only eating it certain times of day it is a set of external rules that either you're imposing on yourself or somebody out there has said hey this worked for me so now i've written a book about it and i have a program about it and i'm all for books and programs i've written a book and it's like you've written a book you know but it's and it's something that is not taking into account your unique lifestyle physiology psychology and it is saying here take this cookie cutter structured way of being and living and eating and let's put it into your life i had this happen two weeks ago somebody came up to me in a meeting and they said they had tried a 30-day challenge with some weight loss person and they gave up after a day and a half and the reason was because it was a structured diet that required them to do about an hour and a half of cook cooking every night. They have three little children at home. He comes home from work dead tired and has to take care of these three little kids. He does not have the bandwidth to do an hour and a half of cooking literally every night. So after a day and a half, he gave up and he's like, I've got to figure out though what will work. And figuring out his diet, not in the sense of rules and regulations, but what works for him, what he enjoys, what, what he chooses to do. And also your diet in the classical sense is very flexible because what works for your lifestyle right now, five years from now may completely change. There are things that are not in my diet because I have food sensitivities, but I don't consider them a diet in the restrictive sense because of weight loss or perfectionism or body image or things like that. I, I think what, what I'm hearing there also, it's, it's a cause and effect kind of a thing. You know that if you eat, so a cheeseburger is not inherently bad for you. It's knowing that if you eat a cheeseburger, you're probably not gonna feel great. You're gonna maybe feel sluggish. A lot of times some of us mm -hmm. will do that and your energy is gonna be low. Is that the way you wanna feel? Yes, eat the cheeseburger. Yeah. Perfectly fine. Just understand the, the cause and effect and there you go. Yeah. And keep on w working with it. Yeah, whereas a diet in the diet vernacular, diet mentality, diet rules thing would say, you had a cheeseburger. You're bad. Yeah. I, so this is a great transition. A lot of what you talk about is this kind of the, the, the mental around it. <coughs> the, the way that we think, the way that we label a lot of these things of 
is this a good thing for me to do? Is this a bad thing for me to do? Give, be that diet, be that a specific exercise and amount of calories I need to burn or consume or not over consume. I know that we kind of mentioned at the beginning, there's this whole aspect of the physical, the mental, emotional, spiritual. Out of those, for you personally, which one do you think that you struggle with uh, the most when it comes to a lot of these things of finding your limitations? And you're welcome if you edit this to fast forward through this long pause. <laughs> so which one just overall do I struggle with the most or which yeah. one? Okay. Uh, mental, 100%. Okay. 100%. What's between the ears? Yeah. In what way? What, what seems to be the kind of that biggest challenge for you that you feel like you might be coming back to every single time? Oh, let's see. Um, the old perfectionism, mm. the, which is really funny because, you know, people, I was having a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago who knew me 20 years ago. And so she knew me in the dieting days, the heavy perfectionism days, the, all of that. And she was saying, oh, well, but you know how you do such and such? And I thought, I've come a long way because I still struggled with those things that I forget it was so bad before I started. I mean, the perfectionism was bad enough. I you know, went through counseling for it and this actually ties together and then I'll jump back into the other stuff. So the perfectionism, when I, I think it was maybe my second or third counselor, I went through them so fast. I wore them out. No, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, so this one particular counselor, she said, I was, I was at Belmont at the time mm -hmm. and she said, I want you to take, what's one of your favorite desserts? And you know, ice cream sandwiches were, was one of my favorite. I like anything, ice cream sandwiches, burritos, anything that is kind of firm on the outside and you bite into it and it goes squish. <laughs> so okay. pe peanut butter sandwiches, bean burritos, whatever. So. She's like, well, get an ice cream sandwich and I want you to sit in the middle of the campus and eat an ice cream sandwich. And I want you to see how many people come by and judge you for it. Because my big thing was, you know, I'm judging myself for this. So people are going to judge me if I eat something sweet or if I eat something like this. Stefan, I had more people come by go, oh, that looks so good. Where'd you get that? Like, oh, okay, people are not, I mean, now it's not that there aren't judgers. There are. Right. And there are, you know, social media, people, trolls, whatever, you know, yes, there are. But that doesn't mean every single friend that you have is judging you for what you're eating or did you work out, you didn't work out today or whatever, you know, a lot of that was what I was putting on myself. And the, so, so back to your question of the mental thing, so the perfectionism, um, the, did I do this? Sometimes it's not, did I do the right or wrong thing, mm -hmm. but did I, did I do that in the right way? You know, or it's, isn't that perfectionism in a way? Well, again? okay. I guess it is. I guess, <laughs> I guess like it. it is. It's, I see how it's a little different, but yeah, yeah, but it's, it is definitely that, uh, are you familiar with the Enneagram? Yes. I'm not great with them. I know what it is and I know the numbers, but I don't remember what the numbers stand for. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm an Enneagram one and our biggest fear is the fear of being bad. Mm -hmm. And we are the ones who have the greatest tendency toward perfectionism, body image issues, uh, dieting, uh, anorexia, you know, all of all the stuff I fell into. It was really easy for me to identify myself on that. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's no problem. That's me. Um, but it is that then beating myself up, worrying about, you know, if I, if I did something right or not. And some of the grappling with that has, has been, what is my reason for doing this? Uh, I remember mm -hmm. years ago, I was living in a little condo and I was having some friends over for the first time there. And I was getting things straightened up and I was putting 
toilet paper in the toilet in the in the bathroom and I was so concerned about as I was cleaning the house well am I cleaning the house because I'm trying to impress them and people please and all that or am I cleaning the house because I want them to be comfortable when they get there that there's not clutter and stuff and all that around and I thought well why am I putting the toilet paper in here so that they don't have to go hey Sherry where's the toilet paper um, or so that you know it's there for them and so anyway, it's just been a constant grapple mm -hmm. of that and a view it seems I I, yeah. I share a lot of those things of where am I doing it for that or not um, yeah I, I feel like I keep on bringing in my mom into this but um, I just it's because you were saying that the house guests coming over there was just always this hilarious thing of there was a time when we had somebody come over to clean the house and she would ask my brother and I to clean the house before they came over. Yes. So that it wouldn't be as, and I'm like, what, why are you paying them? Yes. What is the purpose yes. of this? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm, the reason, I'm also pausing because I'm going through, in my mind as we're talking, I'm going through my journal and I'm going through conversations with John Michael Morgan, who is our business coach, uh, or is my business coach and your business coach, and thinking about conversations with him to see if there are other things other than, you know, a lot of things around perfectionism, you know, we can kind of tag. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to think if there are other things that come up. Um, Let me see if I can maybe yeah, help you prompt. out a That'd little be bit. Um, before when I asked you this, and this is very interesting, and I completely understand why this could change from day to day. When I asked you this question before of which one do you feel like you struggle with, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, your answer was emotional, um, was the harder part for you, uh. which begs the question of how much is mental and emotional tied together, Deader, which are, yes. of course they are, because really it's, if I can't be perfect, what's my emotional response to not being perfect? Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. I'm not loved. I'm, mm -hmm. That, of course, mm -hmm. renders a, a, mm -hmm. an emotional response. Yeah. Um, do you feel that that is that kind of guiding thing or is it very objective for you of where you're going? If I am not perfect objectively, I will fail at this and do that. Or is there also emotion very much tied into it? And that's what makes it hard. Oh, it's, it's definite emotion with it. It's mm -hmm. definitely because it's that I'm, I'm, I'm keep trying to bring back up something that came up for me last night that I felt, oh, I know what it was. Okay. So this whole week. We're going to get really graphic, but I'm going to try not to do too much information here, you all. Um, so I had this beautiful week planned, and I had a lot of physical stuff the past year or so, perimenopause, menopause type things, where I was losing a lot of sleep. Mm -hmm. And with that was barely having any energy to work was, you know, maybe, maybe at best getting 10 good hours of work in a week. And, you know, I would still be trying to function the rest of the time, but maybe 10 good hours. And I would end every week feeling defeated. And why the perfectionism still much better than it was 20, 30 years ago, but it would be, okay, here's the standard. Here's what I'm supposed to be doing. Here's what I should be doing with my business. Here's what I'm actually doing with my business. Who cares that you've only had two hours of sleep every night? Well, so that's continued to get better. But this particular week, I had food poisoning for two and a half days. So there was one client call actually that in the middle of the call, I said, I apologize. Um, I was up most of the night last night sick. I'm feeling sick again right now. We'll need to pause the Zoom call real quick, and then I'll be right back. So I, I went and threw up. I came back, hopped right back on the call, and picked up where, you know, so we were fine. But it was just, it was battling that for two and a half days. And then yesterday I had had a lot of sleep loss. So yesterday was really tired. And so, you know, functioning wasn't there. And so when I went to bed last night, I was like, oh, I've hardly gotten anything done. I wanted to get done this week. I feel so behind and I was like, what was the standard? The standard was assuming that I was going to feel normal this week. I wasn't expecting to wake up Monday morning with all of that. And the emotion to your question, the emotion that comes with that is, defeat it's 
can I, well, of course I guess this is more of a thought of you know can I accomplish what I want to accomplish in life and help the people that I want to help when I'm struggling with these things does that it make does. Any sense what I'm saying okay. do you feel like you have an answer to that question can you accomplish those things or is that I'm still working that through I'm still trying to see how I can well it's self-compassion hmm. of which I am not good at um, of saying okay did you do the best you could did you get the essential things done that was actually one of the things that John helped me with in the year that I was losing massive amounts of sleep was what are the essential things mm -hmm. what are the things that are going to keep things of because my business grew actually while I was in the middle of all of that um, because I was doing okay here are the essential things did I get it done in the way I wanted to did I get it done at the level did I but for like for this week did I help all my, you know did I do all of my client calls yes did I do all the social media posting I wanted to no but social media posting every day and for me is a helpful thing but not essential thing mm -hmm being on that call with that client even though upset at my stomach was being on calls you know with other clients this week even though i wasn't feeling my bed. yes that was essential gotcha going through this journey you've been at it for a, a little over a year at this point it can be kind of scary when all of a sudden you're facing these changes that you don't really control you talk about the journey of, of perimetopause yes. and, and kind of going yeah. going through this and now all of a sudden okay i have to make adjustments i can't really control i have to kind of work with the outcomes that i have yeah. and, and do what i can um that is undoubtedly a, a hard mental battle to kind of yes. keep going through not necessarily saying that it's over it may be it kind of ebbs and flows and some some weeks are going to be harder than others can you tell us any takeaways for you or, or any lessons that you learned going through that kind of battle over the last year or so the now my whole perimenopause journey mm -hmm. actually started a few years ago okay. i went through anxiety attacks um went through all kinds of all of all kinds of stuff you know going to the emergency room because i was thinking i was having a heart attack I'm like how can i be having a heart attack you know i exercise out but it was like but you also want to be cautious and it's like no like, nope, it's just an anxiety attack never had those before but hormonal fluctuations can cause that that all went away everything was cool and then suddenly the sleep loss the insomnia started and that was for a few months and one of the one of the things everybody has things that they struggle with and everybody has things they're really good at mm -hmm. the is this good enough am i doing what i should do the shoulds the perfection all of that that's that's my bear that I have to tame. What I one of the things I'm good at is reaching out for help. Mm. So whether it was through a divorce, when my mom got sick with cancer and died, all of it's like, who do I know who can help me through this? Because I'm lost. And so when I had the insomnia thing for the first couple months, I did everything I knew to do. And when everything that was in my toolkit didn't work, then I started going, what else and who else is out there? I'm not settling, obviously, to live this way. And found a naturopath who does bioidentical hormones. So then she, over the course of several months, was adjusting all of that. And so the whole process from the time I started it until everything resolved was about a year and lessons would be number one don't settle and that's that's not just with hormonal stuff that's with anything mm -hmm. i'm gonna look at the camera right now you all don't settle whatever it is that's frustrating you in your life don't settle uh, and don't take that to everything has to be perfect perfect and perfectionistic and I'm going to be miserable if everything isn't exactly like what I want but that well I guess this is as good as it's going to get I'm just going to live with it no 
don't you don't have to there are people out there that can help you you may not know them but you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows them or you know dr google or you know i mean you know some way um, and if you don't know who that is just start saying like i did that it was the way that i started doing the bioidentical hormone route was it wasn't that oh well i need to go to a naturopath i had no clue but i was vulnerable enough that at a family dinner i was just like you all the reason i'm not putting sentences together right now is because i am massively sleep deprived and here's why and of course my dad is like i don't want to talk about this stuff you know uh, <laughs> but my sister-in-law was the one who said well you know my mother has struggled with that and she's on progesterone biodidical hormones why didn't i think of that and so that's what triggered it had i kept my mouth shut and suffered in silence i would still be dealing with it so that's big lesson number one um what i love in that lesson by the way is that i'm i'm hearing back the echo of the ice cream sandwich in the middle of campus story oh. of where since you were vulnerable you weren't judged for going through these things you weren't yes. judged for not being able to handle it on your own you were just offered help you yeah know, that was that was and the vast majority of the time that is what will happen yes. of course we can't say a hundred percent of no, the time no. but most of the time when you are vulnerable people offer help yes so. absolutely and and the ones that don't I mean for every one person who doesn't there's going to be a hundred people who do and of that hundred some are going to try to band-aid and they're going to try to solve and I mean it's like a friend of mine who's an acupuncturist she was talking about an issue she had and her fiance at the time who's now her husband said well have you tried taking vitamin c for that and she's like i'm a doctor yes i've taken you know it's like it's the simplest thing but she still appreciated him you know attempting to try to help but mm -hmm. um yeah if you're if you're not willing to be vulnerable and allow the potential criticism from a person or two and the potential you know sunday school band-aid easy answer from a person or two to get to the people who can say here's how i can help or here's somebody who might know somebody who can help yeah you, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there and not and that is i'm so thank you for bringing that up because that is one of the things that i've been able to see is not as much of a perfectionistic thing was i don't have to pretend like i have it all together because people mm -hmm. i don't you know none of us do uh, there are areas that I'm further along than somebody else. There's areas that somebody else is further along than me, but none of us have everything together. Do you feel that you have to rationalize that in order for it to be true, or do you have you just come to accept it? And what I mean by that is sometimes going, well, that person makes more money in their business, but I'm in a healthy relationship, or you know, like I have all my hair, what, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, mm -hmm. or is it more that you go? that person makes more money than I do. I'm happy for them. I'm on my own path. We can't compare everything mm -hmm. equally. Mm -hmm. Which way do you, or, or was it one and then you evolved into another? Uh, it's actually a third. Can we go for yes, door number three? Yes, go for door number three. So door number three is, I'm super blessed. I was early on, I can't say I was brought up this way. Um, probably from my mom I was brought up this way obviously I think my mom hung the moon um, that there is an abundance so if you've been blessed in an area or you've done really well in an area in no way hinders my ability to get there so I don't feel a need to um, oh well you know Stefan's really successful with his podcast thing and I've not started mine yet but that's that's okay because blank 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 mm -hmm. um it's just hey cool awesome you're ahead on that on me so guess whose brain i'm gonna pick when i launch <laughs> mine and mm -hmm. so there's there's that piece of it and then there's also the because i know i need you it also makes me then open to if you need something i advice ideas whatever I'm giving it to you not in a I'm a guru I've got it all together I'm giving it to you in a hey cool this is what I've learned on my journey let's share mm -hmm. 
I, I like it. I think it's th that that abundance. I know there's plenty of people. When I did my um, TEDx talk, we had somebody who was talking about the abundance mindset around all of it. And I think it's it's that's a whole other thing to to, to explore and to mm -hmm. talk about. But it's very interesting. It's so interesting that um, your mom kind of brought that up for you of just this mm -hmm. idea of nope, it's going to be fine. It's going to be good. Um, mm -hmm. So. We've talked a good bit about the sort of the, the, the mental side of it, um, the diet side of it. I'd love to touch on bringing it kind of back to that exercise physiology side yeah. of it. And sort of your, you have an understanding, as, as do I, of there are certain things sometimes we may not want to do the thing, but we know it's so good for us. Yes. And we know that we'll finally kind of get over it. Are there any things that, that you try to do even though you don't really like to do them in terms of movement i don't want to completely box you in with exercise uh -huh. it could be exercise or it could be any other kind of thing uh -huh. where you're like yeah i know it's good for me but i'm not the biggest fan of do actually doing it oh okay exercise there are we are all human therefore even when we love exercise there are days that you go i just ain't feeling it <laughs> but I'm blessed that I've got a long enough history with movement, having grown up walking with my mom, that I know if I can get out there for five or 10 minutes, I'm good. And I've also done it long enough, I know if I'm out there for five or 10 minutes and I'm still not feeling it, well, maybe my immune system fighting something. Maybe this is, maybe this needs to be my day off. Mm -hmm. um, so you just intuitively, you, you, turn, you tune into that over time. As far as movement in general, there are things I do that I'm not necessarily in the mood for. Uh, we are gardeners, so gardening is lots of movement, especially when you are not necessarily um, just you know, dropping the little seeds in, but when you're hoeing and, and when you're weeding, going out there and getting in the sunshine, it sounds so romantic and so, not romantic in the, relationship sense but in right. the romanticized sense uh yeah gardening is one of those things that you go out and most of the time i do it because i know i want the result of having the fresh vegetables mm -hmm. um, i'm not right now we are having our retaining wall that was rotting out on the hill is being replaced and that Retaining walls here, garden is here. That means we've not been able to plant a spring garden this year. I ain't missing it at all, you all. <laughs> nope. I, I, I don't feel any sadness over the fact that we're not planting right now. Um, but come about May, will I be wishing that I had some fresh lettuce and some fresh radishes and all, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm okay with the fact I don't have to weed right now. And along that same lines, if I'm standing and I'm chopping, so let's say we've gotten a big harvest. of I, I made a video of this. I don't think I did it on my YouTube channel. I think I did it on Facebook where I did a whole harvest of kale and Swiss chard and washed it and chopped it. And it was this whole you know video thing of that. And it looked so cool on camera, but it was the most boring. Speaking of boring, what we were talking about earlier, it was boring to stand there and chop and chop and blanch and freeze. And, but in the winter time to pull out veggies that you grew yourself, it makes it worth it. So that's, that's really with any movement. Mm -hmm. that's one example of okay I do this because I like the outcome and there are things you can do just like with exercise distraction techniques there are things you can do with any movement that if you're not enjoying it you know put on a movie or a podcast put on Stefan's podcast while you're doing something that you're <laughs> not enjoying no don't do that because then you're gonna start tying together Stefan's podcast with something you don't enjoy and you enjoy Stefan's podcast so don't tie that together anyway or you're gonna start loving exercise because That's you true. love my podcast yes over. We'll, yes we'll go that way yes I'll go that direction I like that <laughs> so you you find things that can distract you things that can make something more enjoyable mm -hmm. and if not, you just sometimes have to go, well, I'm not necessarily in the mood for this, but I like 
what it's going to do for me in the winter and so like we will we'll chop up our chives and our parsley and all that and put them in little ice cube things and pour water over and like yes it's tedious but my goodness to be able when you're making a stew just to pop up in the freezer and throw in three or four things of parsley or chives and it tastes like it's fresh yeah it's golden I think there's there are a lot of little bits from from that entire answer one that I liked was go for the walk go for the five ten minutes and then uh, this is what I find all the time when I don't want to exercise even though my body may not necessarily feel sore or that fatigued I know I have energy but I just don't feel like exerting a lot of energy mm -hmm. Starting for the five or ten minutes of even doing just some warm-up or even walking after a while I go uh, I'm liking this. Mm -hmm. This is I can and mm -hmm. I will go into the rest mm -hmm. of the workout mm -hmm. It's just that starting part that gets yeah. a little bit difficult, yeah. but I think what you touched on in terms of Putting in the work so that you can reap the rewards later. Yeah, it's true for almost anything Every, that we do I think yes. we we touched on the fact that we're very much um, the dopamine hit yes. um, instant gratification kind of culture and that's not where the vast majority of rewards for anything are. Yes. Business, fitness, good nutrition and gardening, yeah. whatever it is. Absolutely. It's the, the same way that uh, one thing that I always love when people say is um, one pizza is not going to ruin your diet. The mm -hmm. same way that one salad is not going to improve it. Yep. Um, it's, yep. it's this constant slow thing. And yes. it, yeah, sometimes you have to just put in the work. Yeah. Um, you were talking about the movement and your experience of you know maybe not always feeling like it but going out and at least doing something i want to go back to that year of sleep deprivation mm -hmm. walking was one of the things movement was one of the things that saved my hide because even if i'd only had two hours of sleep and then the next night three hours and the next night ooh, i got six and then you know it was horrible but oh i've got a meeting or i've got a client call I need to be alert for this. Go outside, walk for a few minutes, get my sunshine. That would get me alert enough to function in what I needed to function in. Um, so movement was critical. And as you know, sleep deprivation is going to dampen all of your feel-good hormones. What increases all of your feel-good hormones? Movement. Movement. Yeah, so it kept that, I won't, I mean, I'm not going to say, oh, well, because of the movement, I had a great year despite the fact I was sleep deprived. No, but I had a functional year. I had a, I can do this. It kept my hope up that I can find a solution. It kept my, it, so yeah, movement from that is critical. And you mentioned something that reminded me, I've got to tell this micro commitment story. This is one of my favorite stories to tell. And any of you who have read Habit, forming habit books about habit forming you've read something about micro commitments well I learned about this from a client 30 years ago I was working at Vanderbilt Medical Center at the time and it was at the fitness center and there was a client who was sitting in the lobby knitting and I went up to her and I said I was teasing her and I said you know the equipment's over there what are you doing down here knitting and she looked at me exhausted and she said, I'm spent. I got nothing. But it's my day to be here, so I'm here. And I said, we need to talk because you're on to something. And with that, she taught me that because at that time, I was still a little bit more into the perfectionism stuff. It was like, okay, if I said I'm going to do an hour and a half workout, if it's an hour and 29 minutes, it doesn't count. It's supposed to be an hour and a half. She was like, nope, it's about forming the habit. And she knew, and she told me this, she said, if I didn't come in on the days I didn't feel like it, then I would end up barely ever coming in and not forming the habit of being here. But she said, because I'm here today, exhausted knitting versus at home knitting, then tomorrow I'll be here working out. And I've shared that with clients since then, and I could bore you with lots and lots of stories of how people have empl employed that some way and it's made the difference. I, I love that story. Um, I've heard a similar kind of a story where a man would go 
and only go for five minutes. Yes. And he cuts it off at five minutes, even though he could do 10, even though yeah. he may, maybe even wanted to, yeah. but it was that idea of no, but I'm building the habit. Yes. If I want to stay longer, I will, I will basically do longer. Uh, and I agree. I, also, the other part that comes to mind is the multitude of actors and comedians that have just said, part of it is just showing up. Yeah. Um, you never know. Be that networking, be that actually going to the gym. You may not be in the mood to socialize or work out mm -hmm. or whatever it is mm -hmm. that, that helps move you ahead in life. Mm -hmm. But just showing up can, can mm -hmm. be a, a huge portion of, of mm -hmm. building up the habit. And we're huge into habit building. Yeah, yeah. And the, the self-compassion piece ties this together for me because perfectionism puts us all in or would put me and my actions in one of two camps you know mm -hmm. good or bad all or none and so when i would hear or say things like well you know you do it even when you're not in the mood for it i would hear that as well if you're if, if you don't feel like it you go do it anyway end of story no room for self-compassion that Oh, well, maybe the reason I didn't work 50 hours this week was because I was sleep deprived. But, you know, did I do the essentials? Versus not in the mood for meaning, oh, a dopamine hit would be a lot more fun than going for a walk in nature. Well, in that case, we might might want to look at habit forming. Does that make sense how I'm comparing the two? It, it does. Um, it actually brings me back to a point um, that I was thinking about when you were talking about boredom while eating is this idea in general we don't like being bored no. we already touched that on that but this idea of boredom while walking and that most of the time we go walk and people go yeah yeah, yeah. I'm gonna listen to my podcast I'm gonna call my friend I'm mm -hmm. gonna I'm gonna listen to music and that it would be really difficult for most people to go and just walk do an mm -hmm. hour walk no other you just look around and just just be by yourself yes. it's hard yes. But again, the creativity and all those things do it, undoubtedly it, kick in. It does kick in because your brain doesn't want to be bored. So if you're not entertaining it, it will find a way to entertain it. And I, I can speak from experience. I go for my morning walks and I've started doing some of them completely no, no input whatsoever. I have my phone in my pocket just because that's what counts my steps. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's about it. And I had four or five things where I was like, oh, I should have taken a picture of that. Oh, that was an interesting thing. I've never seen that swing and there was a bird sitting on it. And wow. most of the time I would have just been walking straight ahead. Just, yeah, yep. Yeah, listen to my podcast. Wow. I might notice some of these things, but it's never, it's never quite as loud, never quite as impressionable. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I definitely agree that we need to get better at being bored because also that helps us process a lot of these yeah. things. Yeah. But we have touched a lot. Yes. Um, we've, we've talked about so many things from all the, the dieting to menopause to the mental side of things, which I think I, I loved all of your, your bits about perfectionism. I also commend you. You've, you've touched on this. I think that a lot of times we do collect together this idea of if I am perfect, I don't ever need to reach out. And um, it was really nice to hear that while you were thinking as a perfectionist, you were still going, no, I can reach out. I can ask for help. Mm -hmm. I think people mm -hmm. uh, combine those too much. I'm sure people will have questions. Where can they find you if they want to reach out and chat or learn more about what you do? Okay. The best place to reach out is just straight up email me. Sherry, S-H-E-R-I, at thevireolife.com. T-H-E. V I R E O L I F E dot com. And if you want to just go and see what all I have out there, I have a YouTube channel, I have Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Those are the three places I hang out the most. Um, and those, either the Vireo Life or Sherry Traxler, S H E R I T R A X L E R. Yes, one R. Don't make the mistake I always make. I don't know why I always want to put two R's. It's because, been my curse. Well, because Sherry can be spelled about 15 different ways. That's why. Um, all those links are going to be in the description below, but Sherry brings up a really good point. Can you tell us a little bit about Vario Life? Yes. So that is a company that I started when I left Vanderbilt. I started originally as Livewell Resources. And then when I was starting my YouTube channel, someone said you really need to get your trademark done so mm -hmm. i went to a trademark attorney again 
didn't know anything about any of this. So I just started reaching out, uh, got it with a trademark attorney and he's like, yeah, live well resources. That's too generic. That ain't going to fly. So went through a whole lot of searching for a name. And when I came across, now this is going to get vulnerable again. We, th we thought we were going tactical. We're going back to vulnerable. Um, when I was going through searching through names and I came across Vireo, it is the form of Latin or Greek, I can't remember which, that is first person, it, it's personal where it means I flourish, I thrive, I am strong and active. There are other versions that mean strong or, you know, active or things, but this was I flourish, I thrive, I am strong and active. And at the time, I was not feeling that. I wasn't feeling like flourishing and thriving and I didn't feel like that I should that you know it's like oh you know who who am I to say that you know I'm you know, I'm supposed to be concerned about you I'm not supposed to be concerned about me but to, to own it and I was like dang I want that for my clients too I want them to be able to own that they flourish that they thrive that they're strong and active so that was why the name was chosen and as far as what I do and what I'm growing this into is coaches who are helping people with intuitive eating and movement habits and workshops for wellness organiza or wellness workshops for companies and organizations. Um, there are some big dreams beyond that, but in a nutshell right now, that's what we do. That's, that's fantastic. The definition of video made me think of a video that you recently did um, where, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a tub for you to re-demonstrate the, the water uh, part, part that you did. But could you, could you just briefly explain it and we'll try to recreate any visuals that we absolutely have to, but it's just, it gives such a good idea. And I think verbally describing it um, can, also, can also help. Oh, yes, yes. I, this came from a client a few years ago who she she was a business owner taking care of an elderly not parent but family member who was dealing with a lot of things teenagers at home there was just a lot on her plate community service and she she felt like i i'm giving out all i can but i'm diabetic i'm this i'm that you know and i, I know medically i need to take care of me and emotionally and mentally and energy wise, I need to take care of me. I don't have anything to give, but I got all these people depending on me. And what I described to her was, and then I've created a visual for this. Uh, I actually did a version of this on a YouTube video and I can give you that link mm -hmm. uh, if you want. It's, I, I told her, I said, it's like you are in this and you've got a little bit of water that you're pouring out into all these other people and then you get a little bit lower and so you take a bucket of water and you put a little bit more in with you you put a little bit more energy in and then you pour out again i said what we need is for your number one job to be filling you up so we put her her glass in the middle of a bucket and then I took this bucket of water and started pouring into her glass. And of course, then it overflowed into all the other areas of her life. And without effort, she wasn't having to struggle to give to this person, to give to this organization, to give to her work. She was full. And it was, as far as results, it wasn't just that visual for her. The results were, as she started doing that, she was able to get off medications, her diabetes resolved, or you know, everything was fine. She dropped like six dress sizes. I mean, it's just like everything turned around when she started saying my number one job is me, my self care, not to be self absorbed, anything like that, but everything is going to come from that. And it did. I think uh, what I take away from that, by the way, is sometimes people can go, but isn't that selfish? Oh, and my yes. usual answer is, if you think it's selfish, it's not selfish. Like, if you even have that thought, you are not the type of person that's probably going to make it selfish. Most likely, <laughs> you are the person that needs to make it a little more about you because you've been giving to others 
far, far more if I'm that's the thought that crosses I'm your mind. I'm stealing that. That yeah. is gold, you all. <laughs> Listen to this man. That is gold. But I love that story. It's a great visual. We'll have the video down because it, it does help. And, and it just, it looks, it's physics, you guys. It's simple. Uh, <laughs> it's, then you can go further and say that it's metaphysics about how we feel and about there how we express to everybody else. Uh, but that just comes from the son of a physicist. What are you going to do? Can't take that out of myself. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it has been more than my pleasure. Thank you so much. This has been fun. I took a lot away from this episode. I had a lot of interesting thoughts about food and I still battle this idea with food personally. Some of the biggest takeaways for me are really this idea of what does my body want and need long-term and what am I willing to handle? I frequently will eat because I want something in the immediate and now, but that makes me feel awful further on. Most of my issues are around overeating. And so it was very helpful to me how Sherry explained this idea of really use it kind of like as, as a research to go, okay, let me plan this out a little bit more. And I can tell you this because this is something that also happens with exercise and with any kind of habit formation. It seems difficult at first. So start with a little bit of something and then you're going to build up further and further and further. So she shared kind of the, the four the four letters around intuitive eating. It doesn't mean that you have to do all four right away. Just start with one and start experimenting and feeling around with it and what impact does that have on you. A lot of times these episodes have a lot of dense information and this allows you to digest it and actually use it because I really want you to not only listen to this stuff but actually be able to gain something from it. And as always, until next time.